Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Cecil comes to us, incidentally, from Half Moon Bay, and I don't know how many of you know it, but she used to be the teaching director over there a couple of years ago, two, one year ago, and uh, she can do a lot of wonderful things. Teaching director should be born knowing how to play the piano and singing, I think. <laughs> I always like to put this on once in a while, <laughs> just for fun. Sort of my, it's my diet overhead. But um, Nancy Sumner one time gave that to me for a, on a card, and so I had it blown up and used it. And uh, we use it once in a while because at the beginning of the year, that's kind of what um, what we see that. Uh, we don't necessarily look any different on the outside uh, when we grow closer to the Lord. We look pretty much the same. But it's what's going on in here, in the little heart of this person, that is changing. And I hope and pray that things are going on in our hearts as we're studying. But I love that. Isn't that sweet? And this week we're studying about Thanksgiving days. And uh, <clears throat> let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come to you this morning. Um, I come to you very tired and even a little hot. And um, I would just pray for you to hold me up long enough for this time. And uh, that indeed that uh, you will have something special from some of the things I've studied for your women and for myself, and I thank you for the time I've had to, uh, to study this lesson. Father, there were many things in here that might have seemed difficult, but we know that the same work of your Holy Spirit will interpret for us the same thing he wrote, and that that's what we depend on. Father, every single person, whether we're brand new to Bible study or we've been studying the Word for 150 years, it doesn't make any difference. We still need the interpretation of your Holy Spirit. And so we ask you for that. And uh, we would pray together that we would know truth, that uh, it really is, I know the desire of my heart and the desire of these women here to know truth. No one wants to be lied to. They want to know the truth. So I pray that, Father, that you will teach us all truth today and as we study your word the rest of this year. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so Moses is still, you know, teaching the Israelites uh, that he was charged with this responsibility. And Moses knew all the things they needed to know over and over again because he had been with them for 40 years. And we, we need to know the same things over and over again. And I think God will, with his own finger, underline various things in the scripture that he wants you to take home and me to take home today. And, uh, and that's, that's always important. And sometimes we will get a truth and we'll think, oh, that everyone else needs the same truth. And they do, maybe, at a different time. And maybe what they're pulling from this, and you're seeing this in class, aren't you, that someone will uh, see something in the scripture they're so excited about, and you think, oh, I already knew that one. Or you'll hear someone say something, and you'll think, I've never seen that before. And that's the exciting thing about studying the word of God. Now, Israel is to obey the laws that God has given him, not in order to become holy. Because we don't become holy on our own. God makes us holy. But she is to obey them because she is holy to God. She is set apart. She is a nation for God. And so she is to obey these. Just like if we uh, know the Ten Commandments, um, we don't study those and become better because we study them. They are, like, uh, they are like the mirror, our dressing mirror, dressing table mirror that we look at and we see our face. And if our face is dirty, looking at those Ten Commandments will not make our face clean. Uh, we, can't, uh, we can't get clean by looking at the law. We get clean by washing and becoming clean and washing literally as we are learning in the blood of the Lamb. And so... This, this week uh, and last week, I want to remember, remind you, too, that when we're studying, we want to look for three things, always, the command, the promises, and the warning, uh, because there's something of that in every one of the things that you will study this year or any year. 
And God's order is always fact first, and then faith and feeling. Now, man's order would be what first? Feeling. Yeah, we want to feel it. We want to feel it first. Then we'll believe it, and then we'll make it a fact. But that's not the way it happens with God. He starts off, and he says, this is truth. Believe it, have faith, and the feelings then will come. And we want to be so careful that we just don't feel good about something we believe. I mean, frankly, I would like to feel good about everything I believe. And later, we might feel good. But we do need to study and we need to search the scriptures. In Acts 17, the Bereans were believers who were thought to be a noble people because they searched the word of God daily. A noble people because they searched the scripture. And we want to do that. And so we're going to search for truth. And when we find it, who's there to meet us? Always. God is there to meet us whenever we find it. And so I would suggest that every week as you go home and you would begin your lesson, whether you're new to the scripture or you've been studying it for all of your life, you will say, just hold your hands on your little Bible and your little notes and just look up and say, God, show me all truth. Show me all truth and then let me use it. I found something the other day that I thought would be worth sharing with you. This is, you won't believe it, but I have something about whorehounds again. You know, you believe it. I mean, it's the it's a cult. It's the end thing. But I but I couldn't. Be, I thought this was wonderful. A few weeks ago, some of you maybe were not here, but I shared about uh, telling about during World War II how the only kind of candy we had were whorehounds and lemon bars or lemon lemon drops, and and uh, and nobody even knows what whorehound bars are anymore or, or drops. I mean, there's like cough drops and. And the next week, um, Juanita Brandenburg came and brought me some candy that she'd bought in a museum, and they were whorehound drops. And, and I thought that was, uh, you know, it's pretty bad when you're old enough, the candy you used to eat's in a museum. And, uh, and then the, uh, the other day, and, that, and then I thought we were surely done with whorehound bars. And then I was in a, in a store the other day, and they were selling some uh, skin care lotion. It was uh, some kind of stuff, I don't know. Uh, and they have the legacy of Dr. Carl Urach and more than 60 years in the making. And it talks about all of these, uh, in this, in this, is these singular products, which simply has no peer, and it names all of these, the chamomile flower and so on. Guess what's in it? Whorehound root. But that's not the good thing. Listen to this. Common to England, this mint herb is one of five plants the Jews took for the feast of the Passover. Wonderful. It's God great to have me find that in a little store. It is native to Europe but grows easily throughout North America because it prefers dry soil and a lot of sun. Whorehound has been widely cultivated in a, on a commercial basis for centuries. Well, I knew that. Also known as Marvin Marble. But isn't that interesting? So, so we know that it was one of the, the roots that they used at Passover. So that's going to change your life a lot, isn't it? I mean, just think, if you had missed today, you might never know that. And that would really, that would really be bad. So we're going to start, if you'll open to Deuteronomy 16, to uh, the Passover. And we'll talk about these three celebrations that we have um, this week. Um, I, my overhead is Thanksgiving days. Oh, I was going to do something really clever and cover that. But, but anyway, I will run through it quickly with you. The Passover, we know, is when the Lord your God saved, him, saved you for himself. It's when he brought the people out of Egypt, remember, over here, brought them in. He's going to take them into his own land. And the Passover for us would be the same when he brought us out of darkness into light. Now, we've said that a lot, but I think we almost have to say that a lot. And then the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, that came after the Passover when the Lord God separated you from sin. He really brought you, separated you from the evil part of your life. And that's ongoing, of course. <laughs> that happens a lot. You're separated, but you have to be dealing with it regularly. Pentecost was when the Lord, your God, gave you the power to live. Now, in, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament, of course, when on Mount Sinai, when the uh, pen, when the uh, the law was given at, at Pentecost. Uh, and when God gave the law, that was to show you how to live. Now, in the New Testament, when at Pentecost, God sent us the Holy Spirit, and that would be the power to live. So you see, this all works together. I mean, the Old and the New Testament really are the same. Uh, one reveals what was concealed in the other, 
I've said that before too, but when the Old Testament is concealed and the New Testament reveals. Let's see what, well, you know what that is. Okay. I've had a few decongestants this morning. <laughs> and then the Feast of the Tabernacles is when the Lord your God brought you together for a season of rejoicing. And, you know, we all have times you, you've been to something like a Billy Graham thing and or you go to a, a Christian campground or Easter sunrise service. Maybe you know no other person in this huge, huge place. When I was little, we used to go to movie theaters and we had Easter sunrise service and everybody stood up and they sang, up from the grave he arose with a mighty Mm, over his foes, what triumph for his foes, and uh, good, you're listening. Is <laughs> it? I was just, a, <laughs> and um, yeah, passing, passing. And but you would always sing these wonderful songs, and you always felt like you were together. And God, I'm sure, heard you as this, as this great unison of voices coming up to praise Him. But truly, every single day in our life should be a Thanksgiving day. Every day is a day, if we remember, and don't forget, like Moses said, if we will remember and not forget, we will remember that God saved us. We will remember that he has separated us from sin, that we are his own. We will remember that he has shown us how to live. He has given us a direction, power. He has given us the Holy Spirit in us to kick us in the stomach, almost literally, when we're doing something we shouldn't do. I mean, he doesn't just nudge. He does nudge, but he gives us, gives us all truth about a subject, and he will come and show us what's happening. And so we need to be excited about that, and we need to come together with a body of believers. If you are not in a church, I'm going to ask you, do not make this your church. This is not a church. What we do here is not worshiping God. We are worshiping because we're together, and we're studying his word, and love for God is pouring out of our hearts. But it's not worshiping together with a body of believers. And so we want to be really careful. I've had people in the past tell me, this is my church. This isn't your church. You are here as a Bible study. And so you need to be looking for a church if you're not. And pray that God will put you in. Also, um, if you have a husband who's not a believer, um, be really careful. Be very sensitive to where he is, what he's doing. But pray because I want to tell you that it's God's will that you're in a church. And God can move your husband. Your husband is not a problem for him at all. Not a problem for you. You can't do anything. But God can. And you get on your knees and you go in your closet and you pray. And you ask God to make you feel guilty and repentant. And you tell God to do anything it takes. And you, whatever it is. I can remember when we were not tithing. It was years ago. And... and um, I had, I had this uh, desire. I knew we were supposed to tithe. I knew we were supposed to tithe. And, um, I, and I think it was, it was about 20 years ago, I can remember. And, and I, we were in a church where they passed out cards where you, they sent them to you and you, you wrote that you would give a certain amount of money. And um, I, that was really difficult because, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to say anything. I have a big mouth. And I'd already been taught by God that I should be a little quiet and let him handle my husband. My husband was a believer. But not until you really get into the scripture do you see what God wants of you. And uh, he was going to a Bible study, too. He was going to Bible study fellowship, and I was going. And, and, uh, but I wanted so much for him to, to tithe. And our business, we would bought a business, and it wasn't doing well. And, and we were broke. I'm here to tell you, we were broke. We had we had a flood and lost a lot of money, and we had a lot of children. It was tough, and and we just lost like eighty thousand dollars on some very bad thing. And and I went into the closet and I got on my knees and I said, "Now I know it's too late this year, God, for you." <laughs> I said because we've already handed in everything. We've already handed in everything, so it's too late. But Lord, next year. Will you, will you have him tie next year? I would have been happy with that. And uh, that very day, we went to church, and the pastor spoke on Malachi, and he talked about tithing and trusting him. And uh, he said, this is the only time God has ever asked you to test him, to see what he would do. So we got up after the service, and my husband, I said, that was a good sermon, wasn't it? He said, that was a great sermon. 
We walked out, we went out to say, say goodbye to everyone, and the pastor was at the door, and my husband said, uh, uh, that was a great sermon, and I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is. I'd like to have a new card. And that day, he pledged, and the, and the year later, during this time, now I don't know if your church does that, All church, some churches have faith giving, which is wonderful, but you do have to determine before God what you're going to give back to him, and to planning, we've studied that too, that you set apart a certain amount. But he said uh, the following year, he stood before that same congregation and he spoke on stewardship. And he told what had happened to him the year before. And uh, then he told also that, uh, that his, how his company had grown and how he had at that time like 12 families and it was wonderful. And he said, there is no way I could have given more money. No way, but he did it. He just took it out, and and God just started blessing us. And so that's wonderful. I don't know why I'm on that. But. So let's get to the Passover. Observe the month of of Abib and celebrate the Passover of the Lord your God, because in that month He brought you out of Egypt. Now these dates were never to be mistaken. You know that that God is big on dates. And it's interesting because he doesn't wear a watch. He has no time zone. You know, he put time here for us. This 24-hour period, this this 365-day year, the, we have a lunar year, we have a solar year. He did this all for us. He doesn't need to know the date. But he, may I say, without any disrespect to him, he is a show-off on, on timing. He is incredible. He is credible. He is not incredible. He's credible. It is amazing to see the way he does things. And I was saying to Nora the other day, it's like he gave the Jewish people a paint-by-number kit. And he wants them to see if they, if they color these things in all right, and if they keep using the right colors for the right thing that is happening, they will see that Jesus Christ is in the Old Testament. They will see what God is doing. But of course, they didn't open their color kit. You've got to start somewhere. And the interesting thing is, because we have the Holy Spirit, we don't need to see these things. We believe, and the Holy Spirit comes into us, and he's there, and we have this wonderful belief, and then the rest of this is just like a buffet for us. We didn't need it to make us believe. So we look back and we see what God was doing. At the time of the Passover, when, when he instituted this, it was very important to the Jewish people that they have the, that they celebrate the Passover on exactly the right date, and they had would have six witnesses for the new moon uh, in order to know exactly that it was new moon time, so they could begin their month. And uh, the six witnesses had to be uh, had to establish credibility. They could not be dice players. They couldn't sell work with pigeons. I mean, I don't know why. Don't ask me why. And I don't know that anyone knows, but that's the way they did it. And then these witnesses would go out and they would watch for the new moon. Excuse me. At the same time, they would be watching for the new moon. There would be people starting fires to uh, disturb them. So a lot of people would come to watch for the new moon. And the Sanhedrin would have this, they would cook these large meals to get the people to sign up to come and look, watch for the new moon because it was so exciting. And then they would really test it and make sure it was a new moon. And then that's when they would have the sacrifice of the Passover. Now, why were these feasts so important to God? We know they were important to him because he wanted us to remember. He wanted us to remember about the deliverance that he had given all of us, them, his provision for them, and the faithfulness. You know, God said, you have choice, but he's still in charge. He is still in charge of everything. And, and the exciting thing is to see how God will take everything and put it together because he's in charge. And yet it seems like we're all still in charge a little bit, aren't we, with our choice. But anyway, God wanted people of like mind to come together, just like I said about the sunrise service. He wanted to bring them together at this time of feast because then his presence would be there. And you know, when his presence is so there, then we become aware of his past mercies. We begin to realize all he has done and his future blessing. Because he is faithful, and we need to see this. We need to constantly be looking 
over our lives to see what God has done. And so we look back at Exodus 12. We saw the beginning of the Passover, and we've talked about that also this year. And we saw that God wanted them to take a pure and spotless lamb, a pure and spotless lamb. And this was painting a picture in their paint kit of the Lord Jesus Christ because he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, before God ever put this world into place. He and Jesus Christ agreed, agreed, that Jesus would be the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. I think that's, I think it's Revelation 13, 8, something like that. And, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, the, the blood was very important at, at Exodus, in Exodus. It said to you to take care of this, this, say, um, this lamb and raise this lamb up until the 14th day. And then when they killed the lamb, they were to take the blood of the lamb and they would put it on the door frames. Now this was exactly the way they did at the time they came out of Egypt, but they continued doing this. The Passover was always a great time of celebration. Now, the Passover to us is the day Jesus Christ was crucified. And when, when they were celebrating the Passover, when they were killing the lamb, when they were sacrificing the lamb, and when they were painting above the door with the blood, our Lord was being sacrificed. And that is always so exciting. And that's why, you know, we always have Easter at different times, don't we? It's never like Thanksgiving, the fourth or last Thursday of the month or whatever it is. It is always a very special time it's always moving around. Sometimes it's the last of March. Sometimes it's the last of April. And it's because we, our Lord Jesus, was crucified at the time of the Passover. And the blood was very important. We read about the blood in Leviticus this week. It was very important. Those of us who are women who have had miscarriages know the, know the experience of seeing the blood come. And you know that there was life in that. And you look at it and you think, that was once my baby. You, you see that. And the, um, uh, we know even with a menstrual period, and all of us have had that if we've not had a miscarriage, we know that that is blood that said, I could have been life, but I was not. So it's, sometimes blood is easier for women to understand, I think. Uh, and in Hebrews, we studied this week that without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness. Now that is God's absolute. That is God's absolute. I was reading in a, a book, Moshe Rowan, Rosen wrote this from Jews for Jesus. And just listen to it. Don't necessarily think it's gospel, but it's very good. Blood represents life itself. Blood is a living fluid. It brings nourishment to the body and cleanses waste. Now we know that. We know that, don't we? And we know that by a blood test they can find out what's wrong with us. By a blood test they can find out if you have AIDS, any kind of infection. In Leviticus 17.11, God was not saying that he had created blood for the purpose of making an atonement, but that because of its unique, vital, biological function, he had set it apart and reserved it solely and expressly for that purpose. The Israelites were not to touch it nor use it for ordinary purposes. In a sense, it was to be regarded as holy. Very interesting, isn't it? Isn't it? And one of the things that we know, that it's a token of the new covenant, uh, the blood is a token of the, of the new covenant. We talk about it in communion. Uh, you may call it in your church the Eucharist, uh, Holy Communion, the, the Lord's Supper, whatever you call it. You know that we always say, do this in remembrance of me. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Some of you use grape juice. Some of you use wine. But no matter what, we are all remembering the Lord, and we're celebrating until his coming until his coming. We know it gives life. John 6 tells us it gives life, brings redemption, brings prop propitiation, that God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. We believe because we believe, we believe in, the, in the fact that he has shed blood for us. It justifies, the blood justifies, it provides access through forgiveness in Colossians, Ephesians, 1 John and Ephesians, and it provides reconciliation, provides cleansing, and makes us overcomers. In Revelation 12, it says, they overcame him, that's the evil one, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. 
by the word of their testimony. So that's always very interesting. And sometimes you read it and you think, yuck, I don't even like to talk about it. And you almost makes you sick when you think, why do they put so much emphasis? And I know my one daughter-in-law, who is not a Christian, said that she used to go to this uh, service and she would, said they sang this song, uh, eat, or, eat My Body, Drink My Blood. And she said, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I said, yes, until you're a believer. And even then, sometimes you think, you know, it's a strange, strange thing to discuss. But that's what, what Jesus Christ has said. And he was our Passover lamb. We always need to remember that. He was the pure and spotless lamb by agreement. Okay, uh, at the same time of, that we have Passover, I have some other things that happened at the same time of Passover. Um, one thing I, I would have to almost leave out because uh, one of the things I read said that God had made his covenant with Abraham even at the same time of the year. Now, I, I have no way of proving that, and I'm working on it, but I read it in a book, and they said there are a lot of verses, and I'm going to run that down for you. But the Passover supper was eaten before when they were in Egypt, and uh, then at Horeb, they had the Passover supper, and then when they went into Canaan, they had the Passover. It was one of the first things they did. And remember this week when we were reading about Josiah coming, finding the book, of, when they found the book of the law and brought it to Josiah, that that law was read and reaffirmed when? At Passover. Passover. And the temple of, uh, the, of Ezra's temple was dedicated on that very day, Passover. Always interesting. And then, of course, uh, the most important thing was uh, about our Lord being crucified, uh, the, the Last Supper that, uh, that he had with his people. And that was at the Passover time. And uh, he said, this is my body, he said to his men, and this is my blood. And so for 2,000 years now, people have been celebrating at that, that time. Sometimes they've been in prison, uh, and they're going to celebrate until the Lord comes again. And that's what we do. We always talk about that. And even though, as I said, we come from different churches, that's one thing that's very, very precious to all of us. And then after that, he said, now begin by counting off seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the standing grain, and this you would come to Pentecost, the Feast of the Weeks, 50 days. Now, in the New Testament, it was 50 days from the resurrection until Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and brought the power to them that they needed in order to uh, serve God, in, in order to go out and bring people in. Now, at that time, they were to bring a free will offering in proportion to the blessings the Lord their God had given you. What would you give him today? What would you give him today? If you were to gather all the thoughts of all the things he has given you, what could you ever give him in proportion to that? Yourself. Yourself. That's what he wants first. First, he says, give me yourself. In 1 Corinthians 8 and 9, remember they said that was one of the things. First, give yourself. When we give ourselves, like St. Augustine, you love God, then do what you like. Because then you will be doing. If we just humble ourselves and come to him. Uh, a friend of mine was telling me the other day, I love this, it's such a fun story. She said they, they received in the mail a check from uh, an income tax refund uh, from the Sacramento, I think, it was a state income tax. And the same day that check came, in the same mailbox, hers, there was a thing for San Francisco uh, Ballet, a little booklet. And it had all of, the, all of this ballet season listed. And she looked in this and found that she could have center seats box seats. Now that's like being in the show, you know. There isn't anything more wonderful than to be in a box seat. And Well, there's a lot of things more wonderful, but if you're going to the ballet, that's the best seat. <laughs> and she looked in it, and she was very clever. She added it all up, and she discovered that for exactly this amount, they could have those seats. They could go to Swan Lake and the Nutcracker, and that, that they could go anytime. They could go night performances, Friday night, whatever. And so when her husband came home, uh, she gave him the check that came and said, um, you know, 
I would really love to have season tickets to the ballet. And he said, you really like ballet, don't you? And she said, oh, I, I just really do. And you know, one of the things I think you probably find too, that we have all of this in San Francisco and we don't do it unless we're almost forced to do it. We miss, you know, we miss plays, we miss all these things. People spend their entire life saving money to come out here and go to some of these things or go to New York and we have it 30 minutes away and we don't get in there. But anyway, her husband said, well, he said, maybe that's what we should do. And she said, yes, maybe that's what we should do. <coughs> and uh, so he had the check and she saw it on the side of his, his table and she said, she picked it up along with some other stuff that she was collecting to put someplace and she took the check and she thought she put it on his desk. And uh, she saved the ballet thing herself by the side of her bed to covet and worship. And uh, <clears throat> so she said that uh, then, uh, then a couple days later, she said something to him again about whatever happened to that check. And he said, I don't know where that check is. So she thought she may have thrown it out. And uh, she kind of looked around a little bit and didn't find it. And uh, then she heard um, Ross Perot, the, uh, one of the candidates for president, sort of uh, make a comment and it hit her. He said, uh, you have bought box seats, but you missed the show. <laughs> Would you count that as from God? Would you count that as God? And uh, so then she thought, well, maybe that was kind of not a good thing to buy box seats after all, and forgot about it. And then one evening her husband came home, and he was really concerned about the need of someone. And he said, I am really concerned. And they talked about, did they have any money? And it was toward the end of the year, so they didn't have that much money right then. They didn't think, I mean, for different things. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, she woke up. And she said, that's the best box seat you could buy. And she woke her husband up and said, I know what we should do with that money. We can give it to those people. And do you know what? That check she couldn't find for several days to buy was right there on the top of his desk. Right there. And do you know that, that the excitement of, of the box seat, center row, center front, to see the face of someone when you can give them money from God is probably about the most wonderful thing any of us can experience. But first, you have to give yourself. Because you know, last week when we talked about my father owns a cattle on a thousand hills, he doesn't need your money. He doesn't need it. He likes to work it back in uh, to what he's doing with the people. Uh, he, you know, every dime you put in, whatever you're putting in any place, whatever you're giving in your church, uh, that money is going. It's going out to bring souls to Christ. And God uses that because he doesn't write checks anymore, you know. He only uses his people. He doesn't have any cash in his pocket. He has his cash right down here. There was a story in, uh, in this, and this is a true story, and I know the person who was involved in this in Texas, and he said they were in a meeting, and they were praying, and boy, did they need money, and it was an amazing thing. And the men all prayed that day, and one man prayed, Oh, Father, you own a cattle on a thousand hills. Today, will you sell some cattle for us? And I, I, you must believe this, because this is so true, beautiful. At that very time, Someone came in to that office and gave a check to a, to a secretary there. And he said, could you see that pastor so-and-so gets this money? He said, I sold some cattle and the Lord told me that you would want this money for something. Is that a great story? And so, you know, the cattle he's selling are yours. He owns him, but the cattle he's selling are yours. So that's a great, fun story, isn't it? I never forgotten it. I love it. It makes your arms stand up. Then we were to celebrate the, your arms or your hair on your arms. <laughs> celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles for seven days after you've gathered the produce of your, off your threshing floor. And you were to celebrate this. And this is probably one of the most exciting festivals they have ever had in the Jewish, in the Jewish faith. And it's exciting. Josephus said, who was a great historian, said, never, you will never experience real joy until you experience the Feast of the Tabernacles in Jerusalem. It is so exciting because right before that, a few days before that, they would have the Day of Atonement when you were at one with God. 
when you, you would confess your sins and the high priest would take his hand and he would put it on a living goat. They first would kill one goat and they would sprinkle the blood again. And, but he would take this living goat and he would touch this goat and place on this goat all of your sin and send him out into the wilderness. And you would be free again of your sin. Now this, I think, is one, one day a year, right? One day. How would you like to have to wait 365 days to confess the sin of this morning? What a blessing it is today that you can do it wrong at 9.01 and at 9.01 and a half. You can confess it. And it's all over. Try not to do it every minute. But the joy of confessing is wonderful. And, and this was especially good because then they would have this great feast of the tabernacles. And I have, and I'm going, I chose to read it if I've got it in here. Oh, I do. God is good. He would have been good even if I didn't have it. But um, I wanted to read it because it's from a book. Uh, do you remember Zahava Glazer? How many of you were in our class? We had Zahava here. Uh, she wrote this book, The Fall Feast of Israel, and uh, she was a wonderful, is still wonderful, but she happens to live now in New York, and once in a while I call her and I'll say, oh, Zahava, I don't understand this. Will you tell me this? And she says, stop thinking Western. She said, you have a Western mind. Stop trying to think everything through too much. But there's a wonderful thing in here. It talks about the Feast of the Tabernacles, and it's a time when they would build booths to remind them of the time they lived in the wilderness. And they would build booths. Now, if you lived in a house and you lived in that town, you would still build a booth because everybody slept over. We all slept out. And they would put booths on their roofs and everything. And, of course, a lot of sacrifices would be brought in for this time because this is also a time when they would make the sacrifices. And these booths were all made out of little wooden sticks and little pieces of greenery. And they were every place, every which place. And at this time... The priest, it was a, a, a celebration called the water drawing, and uh, it's called Nesuk. Did I do that right? Ha Mayim. Is that good? Is that good? Huh? Nesuk Ha Mayim. It's the water drawing time and is rooted in the agricultural character of the feast. And you remember how the Canaanites used to think that the water that came in the rain was the sperm of their gods. Well, these people did not think that. They, they, the Israelites depended upon God for rain and that they knew their creator provided the heavenly waters for their crops. Well, we all know that, don't we? Have you ever heard anybody pray for water like they have in these last few years? I mean, I mean for years, nobody even talked about water. Now we know that we need to really get in touch with God to provide the water. And so at this time, at the water drawing ceremony, that this joyous occasion, this uh, priest, who was a Levitical priest, he had to be because, do you remember the man who lived over here named Jacob who had 12 sons? One of, them, one of his sons' name was Levi. And all of the priests would come from his tribe. Moses was a Levite. Uh, so you had to, in order to be a priest, and we don't know why except God said so, the Levitical priests would descend to the Pool of Siloam, which is in Israel, and uh, in Jerusalem, and he was accompanied by a throng of faithful worshipers. Now try to get this picture. And he would go down, and they would be playing the flute. Don't you love it? It's sort of like the Pied Piper. The Pied Piper kind of is like this. Okay, and then this lilting music would go, and it would enhance the wonder of the ceremony. And then the priest would go down to the pool, and he would fill a very special golden pitcher with water and take it up. And he would enter through the water gate. Now the water gate is still there in the town. In, uh, in, in the old city, there's the water gate. If you've been there, you've seen the water gate. And, and that's why it, and it is called the water gate. It was called that water gate because it was down by the Pool of Shalom. Now, when the priest came back, the trumpets blared, and it said the ram's horn were similar to the ones used on Rosh Hashanah, another holiday which we're not studying right now. And the Mishnah, which is the Jewish book of, of uh, traditional law, specified that there should be first... I love this part. A prolonged blast, then a quavering note, and then again a prolonged blast. Now they don't know that, but we know that. That trumpet was when Jesus is coming again. He came once, 
that he's coming again. Now, they don't know that. They can know that if they search the scriptures and if the Holy Spirit reveals it. And the priest entered the temple area, and then he went directly to the south side of the great altar, and then he put, there were two large silver basins there, and they had to be pretty big. The wide mouth one would hold the wine of the drink offering, and then the western basin was something somewhat narrower, and into it he poured the water from the pool of Shalom. Now, we read John 7 this week, right? We read that Jesus was in Jerusalem at this time. Um, the the um, flutist would keep playing while the water was poured into the basin. Now, think of Jesus being there when this happened, except on the Sabbath. Then the flutists did not play because there's work. <coughs> and the flutists were joined by a choir, I love it, of Israelites, and they would be chanting the words of Psalm 118, and the words were, O Lord, do save, we beseech thee. O Lord, we beseech thee, do send prosperity. And then they shook palm branches, and then they sang uh, the next verse of the same psalm, Hosanna to the Son of David. Who is that? Jesus Christ. I mean, they've got all of it. They've got it all. All of it. Blessed is he who comes, what? In the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Love it. Such great ceremony. Wouldn't you love to be a part of that? Then much deeper was this part about the rain. They love the rain, and you know, the water is always the Holy Spirit. Always referred to as the Holy Spirit in the scripture. May God send his spirit upon us now, they would say. Why is the name, the Talmud would say, why is the name of it called the drawing out of the water? Because of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit according to what is said. And this is in their book in Isaiah. With joy shall ye draw out of the wells of salvation. And then this water ceremony would go on and on, and they would sing some more, and they would say, Hoshiana, Hoshiana, which means, save us now, save us now. O Lord, do save, we beseech thee. O Lord, be, we beseech thee, do send prosperity. Hoshiana, Hoshiana, save us now. I thought this morning I was reading this, and I thought, Hoshiana, my son John, Hoshiana. I thought, do save him now, do save him now. It's a wonderful word, say it, Hoshiana, Hoshiana. Hoshiana. Isn't that wonderful? You can go by places and you can say, Oh Lord, Hoshiana, save them now, save them now. So in John 7, we saw that Jesus in the beginning did not want to tell them yet who he was. And here he is. And again, we have this wonderful God, this perfect timing, this time where he will reveal himself to all those people. The city of Jerusalem was filled to capacity, and that was important, too, for Jesus, because, you know, he wants every soul. He wants us all, doesn't he? And so he would wait until there, the most people possible were there, and then once again the priest went to the pool, and in the presence of thousands and thousands of worshipers, a young itinerant rabbi from Nazareth stood up, and this is what he said. He dared to say, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood out and cried and he said, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. What a celebration. Here he is. The water is coming. They're pouring the water up on the altar. And he steps up. And he says, I will give you water, and you will be satisfied, and you will never thirst again. Who else did he say that to? Woman, woman at the well. I will give you to drink, and you will never, ever thirst again, ever as long as you live. The act of drinking refers to believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's more than just water, but those who hunger and thirst for righteousness whose hearts pant after God as a deer pants for water. Isn't that wonderful? They also had a, a feast of lights where they had candle holders that were 75 feet tall. Now that's big. It's like a seven-story building. I, I, and that's what it said. It says that I figured, I, my husband, I even had him figuring about the cubits. And when they did this and they had all the light, the light would have seen all over from the city of Jerusalem, all over from this holy hill. Lights every place, and everyone had lights 
Everyone would have lights in their patios or in their little courtyards. And Jesus at that time stood up, and what do you think he said then? I am the light of the world. I am the water you waited for. I am the light you have waited for, and I have come. And I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That's who he is, and that's what he's done for all of us. And I hope you're seeing that. I hope that uh, as you're studying, and I know it's tough. Is it tough? Was this week tough? Oh, do you think it was? Yeah. Uh, sometimes it seems more than it is, but you know something? It's good stuff. It's good stuff. And I think you should pat yourself on the back right now and say to yourself, I'm halfway through Deuteronomy. And six weeks ago, I couldn't even spell it. <laughs> now I still can't even say it. <laughs> and, and that's important because in six weeks, we will be able to look at people. And when they say, have you ever studied the book of Deuteronomy? We can say, yes, once in a little church in San Mateo. And we studied it, and it was tough. But we found that God means what he says and says what he means. When he says remember, you better remember what he has done. And I want to remember, don't you, what he's done for me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, that you gave us uh, a sound mind that we can remember. And I pray today for all of us here that, that as we go home, we would look back and we would cherish the years behind. We would... We would look at the years even when we were not believers and remember what you have done for us, how you kept us from harm, and how even sometimes when we were hurting and, and we did receive harm, uh, you were still there and you, you preserved us for this time for you. Father, we never want to forget that, and uh, we never want to forget who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.